Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 429th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we've got Mr. Grant Baldwin on why your keynote speech should fail. How do you like them apples, huh? So we've got this speaking coach, author. He wants your speech to fail. What the heck, man? We're going to get into why hopium is not a strategy, the five steps to get paid speaking gigs, how to get more paid speaking gigs, steak houses and buffets, websites and demo reels, your goals, quite a few other things. So you are in for a treat. Uh, his book just came out, so uh, we pre-recorded this and uh, going live on Tuesday, February 18th, 2020 is when his book uh, was released. So go get it. Um, you can get a link to it from the show notes on the episode. And uh, I hope you get as much out of this interview as I did. Now, let's bring on Grant. Grant Baldwin, author of The Successful Speaker, Five Steps for Booking, Gigs, Getting Paid, and Building Your Platform, all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? Wes, thanks for letting me hang out with you, man. I appreciate it. This has been fun. Hey, you know, I mean, you, you send me that, that nice fruit cake in the cheese basket and, you know, I'm, I'm going to let you on the show. I mean, I, I mean, I got kids to feed, man. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll do whatever. You know? It's easy to suck up to you. I just knew some, <laughs> some food items would get, get things going. Food makes mama happy. Send me bourbon. I'm happy. But then like, I don't <laughs> always hit record on time. I kind of mess up. So go easy on the bourbon, but you know. It's You're good. good we, got, we got to this point. We're recording. We're here. I know. I, yeah. Let me check. Oh, yeah. The red light's on. All right. We're good. We're good. So what's up, man? You're some speaking guru. Are, are you going to tell me how to make like a bazillion dollars flapping my gums on stage? And do I, can I wear this hoodie? Can I wear my jujitsu stuff and speak on stage and make a million dollars? Uh, boy, you, you come out of the gate with a bunch of questions there. So, uh, kind of, that's depends. right. Up, man. Look, it's, it's eight o'clock out here. It's like what? 10 o'clock for you. You should be ready to go. Rise and shine. Uh, can you speak and make, uh, make millions wearing whatever you want? Uh, you know, uh, generally not. Um, hey, there's some oh, people that could probably pull that Ru off. Uh, RuPaul did. I mean, you're a little younger than me, but RuPaul, I, you know, I, I know dude, RuPaul is, I mean, if you want some crazy you stuff to, and make some money, if, if you want to do the RuPaul game, you can certainly <laughs> give it a shot there and see what happens. <laughs> Um, yeah, here's the thing that we've noticed is, is a lot of people are interested in, and not everybody's interested in being a full-time speaker, but a lot of people are interested in speaking. And so whether that's, you know, people who are going, uh, man, I want to speak, you know, 50, 60, 70, a hundred times a year. And other mm. people are like, I don't, I don't want to do that, um, right. uh, for a variety of reasons, but I would love to speak, you know, two, three, five times a year. And I just don't know how to find those gigs. I've done some speaking. People have asked me to speak on some stuff, some word of mouth, some referral, some repeat stuff. But if I wanted to consistently be able to book gigs, uh, uh, how would I go about doing that? So that's the core of what we teach today for people at, at, uh, at a variety of different levels. So looking you up here online, is this true? Delivered nearly a thousand presentations, over half a million people in 47 states. Wouldn't put it up there if it wasn't true. As large as 13,000 people. Where, all right, where was that gig? So it was uh, Oklahoma City. Um, it was a, a state convention, which actually, this is really fun. So this was back in, uh, I think, 2013. Literally at the time of this recording, just uh, about a month ago or so, they um, emailed me and are having me back in, uh, in 2020. So I will be, um, yeah, I'll be coming back for doing that exact same gig. Um, so I'm really excited about that. That's going to be fun. It's also, so, that, so I think there, right there is a good lesson also for, you know, just speakers and entrepreneurs in general. So they, the guy who was in charge of the event back in 2013 um, had retired a few years ago. And so uh, it was a different guy who'd emailed me about a month ago or so. And so I asked him, I said, man, what, why me? You got plenty of options. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge event. It's a, um, it's a popular event. Why me? And so he basically said, uh, I was in the audience in 2013. I saw you speak. You did awesome. I remember what you talked about. I remember the, you know, the energy of the crowd. Um, and we want to bring you back to do the same type of thing. And so I think it's just a good reminder, again, whether you're a speaker or whatever it is that you offer, that the best marketing is a great product or a great service. So, you know, you and I were talking a little bit beforehand. You had come to visit uh, Nashville uh, a couple months ago or so. 
And we were talking about a restaurant that, that I'd been to, you'd been to. And the reason we talk about the restaurant isn't because like, man, the font on the menu was amazing or the decor was awesome or the amount of ice they put in my sweet tea was great. It was like the food was really, really, really good. Uh, and so that's the case with any type of, again, product or service. The reason that people talk about it isn't because of all these other, you know, uh, bells and whistles is because the, the, at the end of the day, the thing that is being delivered upon uh, whatever that product or service is, it, it's really, really good. Yeah. Um, and I'm probably in the, in the camp of, I don't want to be a road warrior, yeah. uh, but I would like to speak more. Uh, and like literally every time I've been paid to speak, somebody, they found me, it was a referral or sometimes just lucky that they just found the website. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't rank for any keynote speaking terms. Right. I mean, I got a few pages on my site. They've been up there for eight years. Um, but I'm not running ads. I'm not doing big campaigns. I'm not a member of the NSA, you know, so how, how can people get started? You know, do, do they have to give a bunch of free talks at the chamber of commerce and rotaries to finally get found or, you know, can they reach out and get a five or seven or 10 grand, 10 grand speaking gig um, right out the bat? Yeah, good question. And so uh, the spot that you're in um, is the spot that a lot of people are in that I, I like speaking, I'd love to do more of it, no idea what to do. And so I think about for, um, you know, you mentioned like the different gigs that you have got in the past, or things that just kind of randomly fell in your lap, which is great when it happens. It's like icing on the cake for a business, but it's a horrible way to actually build a business. So again, whatever the, the product or services that you offer, if you just, I just sit back and I wait for the phone to ring or I wait for someone to magically find me, or I just hope that some, you know, random referral, or I hope like in this, the example I gave earlier, I hope that some client that saw me six, seven years ago, I hope, hopefully they bring me back this year. You know, like that, that's just a, a bad way to build a business because you're just building it based on hope. So you have to have some type of system or strategy to be able to consistently book gigs. So within the book, we talk through what we call the, the speaker success roadmap. So this is basically a five-step process that just kind of outlines how you find and book gigs. So I'll give you kind of a high level view and then we can, we can dig in wherever you want. Um, but the first one, uh, and it makes the acronym speak S P E A K. Uh, so S is select a problem to solve, select a problem to solve. And so this is where you answer really two key questions of who you speak to and what's the problem that you solve or what do you talk about for that audience? So this is the most important part because this is the part where a lot of people struggle is because we just, for a lot of people who like speaking, they just, they, they want to speak to anybody about anything. So if we were to ask you like, you know, who do you speak to? And people are like, I just, you know, I speak to humans, you know, I talk to people, um, which is a, a horrible way to build a business in the same way that if we say, you know, what do you speak about? or what's the problem that you solve? And you say, you know, I, I can talk about anything. What do you want me to I can talk about sales or leadership or change or motivation or innovation or uh, customer service. It's like, you, you can't though. You can't do all those things. So we tell speakers all the time, that you want to be the steakhouse and not the buffet. Be the steakhouse and not the buffet. Meaning, Wes, if you and I were gonna go you know, grab a steak somewhere, then uh, you got a choice. You can go to a buffet where steak is one of 100 different things that they offer, and they're, they're probably all mediocre. Or we could go to a steakhouse where that's all they do. If you want tacos, you want lasagna, you want pizza, you want anything else, they don't do that. But if you want a steak, they are the go-to place for that. Uh, and so the same thing is true as a speaker and, and it, really any entrepreneur is you want to make sure that you are the steakhouse. I offer one specific solution for one specific audience and trying to be, instead of trying to be all things to all people. So that's the first part, select a problem to solve. The, the P is in prepare your talk, prepare your talk. So you're clear on who you speak to, you're clear on what's the problem that you solve, you put the talk together uh, and we dig into that of you know how you do that and what goes into that talk, um, stories, humor, slides, all of that. Uh, the E is establish yourself as the expert. So letting people know that you exist and you do this through the two primary tools are your website and your demo video. Uh, so if you don't have a website, you don't have a video, it's, it's generally hard to get booked uh, to speak. Uh, the A is acquire paid speaking gigs, um, which is ultimately what you, you're kind of asking about. So we'll put a, a pin in that. Let's come back to that. I'll give you the, the K first and we'll come back on the A. The K, know when to scale, know when to scale, meaning that for a lot of people who are interested in speaking, they're also interested in, you know, writing a book or doing a course or coaching, consulting, any number of other products or services that they may be interested in helping people with beyond just speaking. Uh, and so the point being that you can do all those things, you just can't do them all at once. Like something's going to come first, something's going to come last. So be clear on how speaking fits into the overall business. Uh, so now let's come back to the A, all right? Uh, so, okay, Grant, I want to book gigs. How do I actually do that? Um, but it's the fourth step in the process. So again, going back to what we talked about, if you're really clear on who you speak to and what's the problem that you solve, 
it's counterintuitive, but actually the more narrow, the more focused you are, it's actually easier to book gigs. And so you want to make sure that you're really, really clear on that. But from there, uh, once you have your website, you have your talk, you know who you speak to, you know what the problem is that you solve. Uh, the simplest thing, you, and there's a bunch of different things you can do, but one of the simplest ways to get started is just by uh, reaching out to people and emailing people and asking people. Uh, for like a conference or an event, an organization that, that is hosting some type of an event, like they're already planning on hiring speakers. You're not trying to convince them to hire a speaker. They're already planning on it. You're just showing them why you are a good fit. Um, and so that's a simplest form. Like that's part of what you're doing is you're asking. Uh, the reason that we are talking right now uh, on this podcast is because I sent you an email and I asked, hey, if you're ever looking for a podcast guest, uh, holler at me, I'd love to chat. Uh, we're gonna have you uh, on our show for the exact same reason. It's because you ask, right? Because we're both providing a solution to the problem that the other one has, uh, providing uh, quality guests for our audiences on specific topics, right? So that's the simplest thing to do is just by starting by asking, but you have to have some of these other pieces in place to know um, uh, what it is that you're looking for and who it is that you're asking. So when you started, what was the talk you were giving? What was the problem you were solving? So I got to imagine after all these talks, nearly a thousand, um, that y y your keynote has evolved. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so in the, the, in the beginning, what were you, what pain were you solving or addressing? Yeah. So if we go way back, um, I actually, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, I went to Bible college and was a youth pastor at a local church for a little while, did a lot of speaking there, uh, and then got into speaking from there, kind of speaking on my own. And so as a former youth pastor, like I got my start speaking on a, on a lot when in the education space. So I did a lot with uh, high schools, a lot of school assemblies, a lot of colleges, uh, a lot of student leadership conferences. So um, speaking of various state, regional, national conferences uh, around the country. Uh, so that's the bulk of what we did. So I did a lot with students on, uh, did a lot with, on motivation, did a lot on, um, uh, on thinking through like life after high school, um, thinking through like career stuff, thinking through college stuff. So there's a couple of different topics there that I did. But for example, um, you know, going back to the steakhouse, not the buffet, when people would ask, um, you know, like in the education space, a popular topic is, is related to, you know, like drug and alcohol awareness or bullying um, or, or a couple of common topics. And I didn't do anything on this. Um, and so when people would ask like, uh, yeah, I'm happy to recommend or refer you to other people, or here's kind of a spin I can do on that, even though it's not directly maybe what you're looking for. Uh, but again, trying to be the steakhouse, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm really, really good in this lane, but I'm not going to try to be all things for all people. Uh, and so that's kind of a, so I did a lot of speaking in that space that kind of evolved to doing more uh, with associations with corporations. I did some stuff on work-life balance, uh, but a lot of the speaking I do today is more um, a, a kind of what we're, what we're talking about now is helping uh, people in the speaking industry. So I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs who want to start using more speaking in their business. So yeah, it's, it's definitely evolves and changes in the same way that um, for most businesses, most small businesses, most entrepreneurs listening, probably haven't done the exact same thing their entire career. You know, you, you, you start with something and it kind of evolves and pivots and changes over time based on, you know, your, your, uh, your own interests, your own desires, your own passions, but also like what the market's looking for, uh, your stage and phase of life, um, where you're at in the business, what it is that you're trying to accomplish kind of evolves and changes. And so that being a speaker and what you speak about and the problem that you solve, um, is, is very much the same thing. So, because I mean, what you were saying in the beginning, it sounded like it was a little bit varied, but is it like how specific should we be, right? Is it, hey, I speak to, you know, seniors in high school uh, that are considering private universities and they are left-handed uh, and also play the guitar and are yeah. captains of the football team, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, or, right. or is it like, well, I, I speak to high school kids, you know, of any age. And, yeah. you know, and, you know, I talk about like how to get into the college you want or I talk about how to get more out of life, how to, how to yeah. leverage high school to be a springboard into your best future, right? How, yeah. how do you know how specific to make it versus, you know, a little bit broader? Yeah, great question. So there's really, there's two, there's a couple of variables and factors, two big ones that come to mind. One is going to be kind of your own goals and what it is that you're trying to accomplish with speaking. Meaning if you said, um, man, I want to speak, I want to speak 75 times a year. Um, then you got to think through if you go too niche and too narrow, 
are there even 75 opportunities that exist? So everything that you just described there, are there even 75 opportunities that exist for that, right? Versus if you said, um, I've got a full-time thing going, um, I actually do a lot of coaching with those left-handed guitar playing, you know, football quarterbacks. Um, and so uh, I, I can't speak full-time to them, but I'd love to do, you know, two or three gigs. I don't know, maybe you could find uh, a couple things around that. So there's, there's that side of it, of just kind of your own goals and ambitions for how speaking fits into things. The other side of the equation that maybe the bigger part is just the market needs and the market demands. So just because you're passionate about a topic, and again, this isn't exclusive to just speaking, this is true in any business, just because you care about a topic, just because something that you feel like something's a problem, doesn't necessarily mean that other people feel the same way. So one of the things we talk about is, uh, as a speaker, you're trying to find uh, um, uh, kind of an overlap of interest. Uh, and interest is a two-way street. Just because you care about a topic, just because you're passionate about a topic, just because you're interested in a topic, doesn't mean people pay speakers to come in and talk about that. So I knew, like at least going back in the education space, I knew that there was a lot of, of, of opportunities that exist for schools that would hire speakers to come in and do you know, a, a motivational and inspirational uh, talk to some degree, right? But I knew that schools typically weren't hiring speakers to come in to talk to their left-handed quarterbacks about playing guitar. Uh, so I was also trying to figure out, okay, here's, a, here's kind of a, a category that I'm interested in and passionate about um, without, uh, but also looking for the opportunity that actually exists. Now, to your point, there's a lot of things that I turned down because of either topic, like I mentioned, there are things that they were looking for that I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable or speaking about, or there are people that were better suited at it. Uh, and two, there are things where people would say, Hey, do you speak to, you speak to elementary students or do you speak to middle schools or do you speak to this audience? I was like, I, I, I don't like, um, so in the same way that like a, a steakhouse, uh, so we, we do steak really, really well. Oh man, I'm, I'm really in the mood for pizza man, there's a great pizza place right down the street, right down the street. You got to go check them out. Um, could we do pizza? I, you know, maybe, but you're probably gonna be better off if you really want pizza to go down the road for that. Um, I'll give you another example here. So think, think of it this way. Let's imagine, um, let's imagine God forbid Wes that you needed, um, brain surgery. All right. So, um, you've got a choice. You could go to like your local family doctor who is a doctor. They have all the important letters before and after their name. Uh, they went to medical school. They've probably done some surgeries before. So they hypothetically could do brain surgery, right? Or you could go to the person that day in and day out, they, oh, that's all they do. They, they are a brain surgeon through and through. Uh, that is the core of their business and they are the best on the planet at, at that. Like, I don't know about you, man, but that's, that's where I'm gonna go. I wanna go to that guy versus the guy who's like, I don't know, like I'm sure I could kind of figure it out. Dude, like, I don't look. I'm going to get some essential oil. I'm getting some essential oils. It's all good. <laughs> That's good. That's all you need. That's, but like you, you want to go to the person that, um, that like they're the go-to authority. Like they're the go-to expert on this versus someone who's like, yeah, I could probably figure that out. You know? So again, it's the, you want to be the steakhouse and not the buffet. Um, and the other thing too is like that, that brain surgeon, because they're niched, because they're narrow, because they're focused, they're going to be able to charge a premium for what it is that they do. Uh, and so instead of trying to be, again, all things for all people, you, you, you're picking a lane and saying, I'm, I'm the go-to uh, person on this. Yeah. And I know people get, they're afraid. They think they, they're going to be too niched. Mm -hmm. And reality is they're not niched enough and they, they don't come across as an expert, huh? When they're yeah. coming out too broad. Yeah, very much. And so, um, so a couple ways that you can kind of like, how do you actually figure this out, man? I think I'm narrow enough, or I think I've got the idea, you know, how do I know if it's the right fit? So a couple thoughts here. One is to look for other speakers who are doing something similar. Okay. Um, if you can find some uh, and look for other speakers that are similar to where you're at in your career. So if you look at me like, okay, I'm interested in speaking and let's see what Tony Robbins is up to. All right. So Tony speaks on business and marriage and relationships and, you know, uh, motivation. So if he can do it, then I can do it. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay. So look for people who are doing something similar to where you're at in your career. Uh, and then you can kind of evolve over time from there. Another thing you can do or actually one final thought on that would be, you know, so if you're looking and you're like, man, I can't find any speakers who are doing this, I'm going to be the first. That's typically not a good thing. So you actually want to find other speakers who are speaking to a specific audience on a specific topic because it just proves that there's a market there. Uh, another thing you could do is look for the type of events that or organizations that would hire a speaker like you. If you're like, man, they don't, they don't exist, then it's going to be hard to get any bookings with a, a market that doesn't exist. So there'd be a couple thoughts there of things that you could, you could start kind of doing some research for. The other thing I would say is that 
okay, I think I've got it narrowed down. I think I've got it right, but I'm not sure. The reality is, is you're never going to be sure until you actually get started. So think about it like um, it's really hard to steer a car that's parked. But if you get the car moving, even if it's just a couple of miles an hour, it's just a lot easier once you've got a little bit of momentum there to steer. So remember, whenever you pick whatever that path is that you're going to be on as a speaker, you're not making a permanent decision. So it's not like, man, I can only speak to this audience and I can only speak on this topic forever and ever and ever. This is not a tattoo. This is not a lifelong commitment. You're just picking a starting point. And then like most businesses, they evolve, they change, they pivot over time. But at this point, we're just trying to get some momentum. We're just trying to get started. Right. So do you, do you use presentations and do you, do you totally like stick to it? Uh, you know, like are you given the same, if you speak a thousand times, if you speak a hundred times this next year, will it be 99% the same, 70% the same, 10% the same? Yeah. Um, a lot of it will be the same. Now, uh, the way I approach speaking, the way, um, I would recommend for speakers is that it's not necessarily always a, um, here's the exact same talk every single time. A way to think about this is kind of, um, like modules or bits. Uh, so it may be, I'm going to give more or less the, the same talk, but for this audience, I'm going to use this illustration, but for a different audience, I'm going to use maybe a slightly different illustration it makes the same point, but it may be, may be told or the point may be, you know, slightly different. Um, so you can have some of those pieces that you can kind of move, move around. So think of it like a, um, you know, a band and a set list at a concert. So they're probably going to play the, the same 20, you know, 20 to 30 songs or whatever, but the order that those songs may go in may vary. Right. Um, so that's one way to think about it. The other thing I would say just as a general rule is, uh, if you are having to create a brand new talk from scratch every time you speak, that's a horribly inefficient way to do it. Because when you speak, each time you speak, assuming it's to a new audience, the talk gets better because you're getting that immediate feedback of this worked or that didn't work or this made sense or that resonated or that was funny or that wasn't funny. And so I'm going to add this or cut that or tweak that. And you get that real time feedback. So each time you give the same presentation, you are able to tweak it and it gets better over time. Uh, and so whenever a, a client is hiring you, they're hiring you to give your best, not like here's some material I'm trying to workshop and hopefully that it, it, it works. So again, let's go back to like the restaurant, the food analogy. Like when you go to a restaurant, um, you could tell the chef like, hey, just whip up something that you've never made. And it might be decent, but part of you is like, I want your signature dish. Like the thing that you've made thousands of times that you've refined, that you've got perfected that's the thing I want. And it's no different for a speaker. Like that's the thing that you should be delivering rather than just kind of like, eh, I'm just going to kind of come up with some material and wing it. I, I don't recommend that at all. Yeah. And so what do you consider a brand new talk? Cause like I've the first lead magnet, first talk, first product I ever created was the seven deadly sins of selling. Mm -hmm. And Vegas, uh, a, a funeral and cremation, uh, association brought me in to speak in okay. Vegas, right? And they had a theme and it was, it was, it was like re like rebuild, reinvent, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, I did, I totally, uh, it was a new talk for me in so far as sticking with that theme, but it was my same seven points. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Right. Um, last year, um, or earlier this year in Jacksonville, I spoke to a, some power association and, and their theme was golf. Mm -hmm. You know, so I gave, it was a whole new presentation using golf analogies, but it was still the same seven points. So yep. do you consider that a, a new talk? Or is that the same talk just customized to the audience? Yeah. And so whenever we talk about like customizing a talk, um, I think what you describe is spot on what I would recommend, uh, meaning that, you know, 80 to 90% of the talk is going to be the same. These seven points, these seven deadly sins, like these are the same in any industry. You know, when it comes to sales, these are the things that you have to have in place. Now I'm going to tweak 10% of it based on the audience or based on the theme or, you know, based on some, you know, key phrase that they want me to use. So to that, to that end, you know, you throw in like a, a, um, a golf story or, um, a, um, uh, tying in their theme or using that line a time or two. And they feel like, wow, this talk was in, this is like perfect. This, he made this just for us. Well, he didn't, you made it for, uh, like, here's the core content that's going to be there, but then I'm going to tweak a few things here and there. So it's kind of like, you know, if you go, if you go see a band or if you go see a comedian, right, they're going to pretty much do the same set. They're going to do the same material, but they might say they might do, you know, a couple of minutes specific to whatever city or town that they're in. And you feel like, Whoa, that was amazing. This whole thing is just for us. Well, 
it's not, but a few of the, a few minutes of their sprinkled in all of a sudden makes it feel like, wow, this was just for us. Yeah. I probably over customize. <laughs> and, and, and I would say this, like, um, there's not a right or wrong way to do it because I know some speakers that, that say, I'm not going to customize a word. This talk is flawless and this is it. Take it or leave it. And that's fine. Like you can go that approach and some do massive amounts of research and customization and like both can work. So some of it depends on you, what you want to do. Some of it depends on, you know, the clients that you may be working with. And so for a, a speaker that says, this is it, take it or leave it. They know like sometimes they're going to lose business that way. And they, a client's going to want it more customized. And they said, sorry, we don't do that. Uh, right. And that's fine. Like as long as you recognize that, Again, you, you don't necessarily have to do um, a, a massive amount of customization. You don't also have to do a little bit of customization. You can do what makes sense for you. Right. Very cool. So if somebody wants to get started, right? They're like, all right, the, it's a new year. It's a new me. The world needs to hear my, my <laughs> message. Yeah, come on. You know, uh, do they Google associations? Should they, should they try to give a few free talks locally and kind of get some of the nerves out? You know, like what's, what's the first thing they should do? Yeah, what I'd recommend is, again, going back through that, that, uh, that roadmap, uh, that speak framework. Um, so first part is just getting really, really, really clear on who you speak to and what you speak about. This is the problem that most speakers like, yeah, yeah, I kind of have a vague idea. I just want to speak. And we just kind of bypass that. And I get it. Like, um, that's the part like, uh, cause it's, it's, it's some research, it's some thinking, um, it's some processing like, yeah, yeah I just want to get to the tactical, you know, actionable stuff of like, I want to actually start booking gigs. But if you, again, it's like the restaurant, if you don't, I just want to start making food, but if you don't know what kind of food you're making or who you who the restaurant is for, like you just, you, you can't just start making food and hope that it just magically works out. Like it just doesn't work like that. Right. So spending the time to really get clear is the, is the first key. Uh, part of the process there. Then you can start working on the talk. Then you can start again, working on the website demo video. Uh, and then whenever it comes to, you know, I think part of what you're asking there is like, you know, should you speak for free or speaking for free, you know, a bad thing. Um, I think speaking for free uh, can actually serve a lot of good uh, and provide a lot of, of, of value. The key I would say is that uh, if you're going to speak for free, you need to know why you're doing it. Don't just speak for free out of the goodness of your heart, right? Because you got to make the shift. Right? You may love speaking, but you're also running a business. You're a business owner. And so you can't just give away the farm just because like, uh, I just want, I want to help people. And I want, want to make people happy. Like you're running a business, you're providing value. You need to be able to charge and be compensated for that value that you're delivering. Now, having said that, there's a lot of reasons why it may make sense to speak for free. So for example, let's say you offer some type of, you know, product or service and you want to use speaking as lead gen. So for example, uh, there's a, a client that we worked with who he speaks 40, 50 times a year for free. Uh, and so on paper, you're like, why would he do that much? Like, what's the point of that? But he has a life coaching business on the back end. And so all that he does with the speaking is lead gen for the life coaching business. So the life coaching business is a $300,000 plus business but it's all predicated on speaking for free. So you're like, oh, dang, that, okay, that makes sense, right? If you have a book, a product, a service, uh, coaching, consulting, if you offer some type of, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 coaching package, and you know, man, if I go speak at something and I get one client out of it, it may be worth way more than what, that, what, they, what the event planner could have paid you in the first place. So it's incredibly valuable for you, incredibly lucrative uh, for you to go speak. Um, right. The other thing I would say is it may make sense to speak just to practice. The way that you get better as a speaker is the way is how you get better at anything. You practice. The reason that I don't think I'm the world's best speaker, I think I'm, I'm pretty decent at it in large part because I've given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of presentations in all different environments and some that have gone really well and some that have been complete disasters and everything in between. And so the way that you become a better speaker is that you speak. The way you become a better writer is that you write. The way that you become better at golf is that you golf, right? And so you have to continually like work on that speaking muscle. So one way that you, or one reason that you might speak for free uh, is just to get the practice. It's just get the reps in. Uh, so a good example of this is there is a, a documentary. I, th I know it was on Netflix. I think it's still there um, called Comedian. Have you seen this by chance? Comedian? So with, yeah, Comedian with Jerry Seinfeld. No. All right. It's so on here's Netflix? The, yeah, yeah. I think it's on Netflix. So here's the premise. So um, Seinfeld is known for the show Seinfeld, but 
prior to that and since then, uh, the way he makes his living uh, beyond royalties from the show is stand-up comedy. Like the guy still tours constantly uh, doing comedy. And so after the show, Seinfeld ends, he's working on basically new material. He's working on a new set. And so he, what the, what the documentary is, is he is going from club to club to club, all these little clubs, trying new material. And sometimes it's working and sometimes it's bombing. And so you, what, what's interesting is you just kind of see the behind the curtain of, of quote unquote how the sausage is made. Because you see like Seinfeld get up on stage or you see any comedian get up on stage and you're like, or you watch a Netflix special and you think like, oh, they're just funny. They just got up on stage and do that. But the reality is, is like there was a ton of work behind the scenes oh, yeah. that they did that got to that point. And so the same thing is true for a speaker. Maybe you're just, you're getting, you want, you have a new story or you have some new material. And so the win for you is just to get up on stage and practice. Because when you're working on a new talk, when you write out a new talk, it's kind of an educated guess until you get in front of an audience. I think this will work. I think this is funny. I think this will resonate, but you don't know until you get right. in front of that audience. But then you get that real time feedback that makes the talk better. Uh, and so that may make, that may be a reason for you to speak for free. All those clubs that Seinfeld's going around doing, he's one of the, the you know, the biggest comedians, one of the biggest stars in the world. He could say, nah, I'm not, I'm above that. I don't need to do that. But he's saying, I want to get better at my craft. So I'm going to do, I'm going to bounce around to these clubs just to pro, just to practice and try new material and do this for free. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's definitely, that's a, a documentary. I would, I would recommend and it would be worth checking out. All right. I was pulling it up. And of course, Netflix, they got a, some dudes talking, right? They're being like, come on, man. I got to do a podcast and look at Netflix. You can't do volume. Oh, I had to turn it off. All right. I'll you. go look it up. You. I know, man. Check it out. Uh, man, talk about, talk about hard. I did an open mic years ago. A friend of mine has a comedy club he used to here in town. And dude, that was the hardest six minutes. Yeah. I, Good grief. I, I, um, I do not uh, do not envy you at all for doing that. Oh. I've, I've never done I've never done the open mic thing, but I know speakers that do it, that do it on a regular basis just to again, just to get practice, just to get better. Cause you you try new material uh and and see what works, what doesn't work, some stuff that works and they use uh, whenever they're going out and speaking. It also helps you to know how to interact with an audience, interact with a crowd, to deal with people who maybe don't want to be there. Uh so yeah, open mic, stand up, it's a tough business for sure. Dude, it's like it's like the Twitter of of writing, right? Yeah. <laughs> You, everything has to be spot on, right? No, there's yep. no room for wasted content, wasted anything. It was, but yeah, it'll make you tough, man. Very much so. Um, good Thanks grief. Uh, so how, how does somebody know what they're worth, right? What if they've never charged or they've charged a little bit here and there, you know, cause you can, you, you think you're, you're doing them a favor and you're, you know, only going to charge a couple grand, but it's like, their budget was 20 grand. They're like, oh, yeah. you must be like a beginner. Yeah, we're, we're going to yeah. have to pass on you. And the reality is you could have given a $15,000 talk. But so how do you how do you know where to start? Yeah, it's a good question. There's a couple of factors that go into figuring out your fee. Uh, one is going to be your industry or your market. You're going to be able to charge more in some industries versus others. You can charge more speaking to corporations than you can to churches. You can charge more speaking to colleges than you could to elementary schools. It's not that one's better or worse than the other. There's just different industries are going to pay different amounts. Uh, your experience level is going to matter. If you're a brand new speaker, just getting started, you've done a couple of free things, maybe a couple of paid talks, you typically won't be able to charge as much as someone who just has a lot more experience. And, and uh, because of that, that, they're just a much more polished and just a better speaker. Um, another factor is going to be your marketing materials. So if you're going to charge, you know, five thousand or ten thousand dollars to speak, then your marketing materials, specifically your website, your video, they need to be on par with other speakers who are charging five thousand, ten thousand dollars. Because most most clients who are considering speakers, they may be looking at five speakers or ten speakers and just kind of reviewing them, and they're trying to compare apples to apples there. So you need to make sure that your stuff looks sharp, because whether we like it or not, like people still judge books by their covers. If you're a phenomenal speaker, but your website sucks, people are going to assume that you suck as a speaker. It may not be true, it may not be accurate, it may not be fair, but we all do it. Um, now, having said that, um, you know, how much should you charge? Well, the honest answer is it depends. Like there's a lot of factors that go into it, which uh, I know is the, the right answer, but it's also a horrible answer because uh, it, it doesn't actually help. So right. we actually, we put together a free calculator, spe a free speaker fee calculator for this. Uh, people can check out if they want uh, at myspeakerfee.com, myspeakerfee.com. You answer six or seven questions uh, and it'll tell you what you should be charging as a, as a speaker. Now it's certainly, uh, it's much more of an art than a science 
sense, but that at least gets you in the ballpark and factors in, uh, you know, some different variables specific to you and, and the audience that you would be speaking to. Right. Very smart doing that. One of my top uh, lead tools is uh, a quiz, uh, mm -hmm. bestcrmforme.com, right? Yeah, so, yep. Uh, and it asks a lot of hard questions. Some people are like, oh, there should be less questions. I'm like, they're all multiple choice, dude. It's like, good grief, yeah, yeah. you know? But these are the questions you got to answer. Uh, totally. totally. To get so, to the truth. Yeah. Right? Like, like in your situation, you know, should I, you know, should I use Infusionsoft or HubSpot or Drip or Entreport or Active Campaign or, you know, any of them? Uh, and the answer is it depends. There are a lot of variables and factors. So um, again, it's not an exact science there of how do you narrow down and say, you know, which one is best in the same way that that, that calculator is going to give you a number. Don't swear by it as gospel, but it gets you in the ballpark of what you need to be thinking about. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a good place to start. Yeah, cool. So do you uh do you always use slides? Do you ever speak extemporaneously? Uh I never use slides, um but I don't speak extemporaneously either. Uh because uh any speaker that gets up on stage, you need to like you're not just getting up with all right, here's a couple of thoughts and I'm just going to kind of wing it and see what comes out. I don't recommend that. It's not a good it's not a good uh uh product and and end user experience. You want to give them your best. You want to take the time to think about it and be prepared. Um now having said that though, um whether or not you should use slides, it, it kind of depends. There's a lot of upside to using slides, you know. So, um, you know, uh most people uh, listening right now, like they, you know, if we were going to talk about something and, and we pull up a picture and we're talking about a picture or something, it, it's, it, you can only describe it so much versus someone actually seeing the picture. Right. Uh, and so that's the same thing that's true for a speaker. The thing I don't like about slides is one, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with technology and mm -hmm. the slides don't work or the slide doesn't advance or, you know, the, the adapter doesn't work or breaks down or you can't hear it or whatever. There's a lot of things that can go wrong there. So I, I like just removing that variable. The bigger issue I have with slides though, is a lot of speakers uh, spend more energy and effort on the slides than the actual talk. Yeah. So here's a kind of a, a barometer to think about it. Um, if five minutes before your talk, the slides don't work, the technology breaks, the projector goes down and you can't use slides. Is your talk still ready? And is it still strong? And does it stand on its own? Because basically slides should be an enhancement, not a replacement for your talk. Slides should be an enhancement, not a replacement for your talk. I remember uh, I was attending a conference a couple of years ago and um, uh, it was going to a workshop and the session was supposed to start at you know, 10 a.m. or whatever. And it's 10.05, 10, 10.10. 10. The, uh, the speaker's still messing with the slides, still messing with slides and basically tells the audience like, hey, I'm sorry, the slides aren't working. I can't give my presentation unless my slides are working. Mm. And I want to be like, then you're not ready. Like you shouldn't be up there. So you, your, your talk needs to stand on its own. And so if, it's, um, if you're using your, your slides as cue cards, as you're using it as a script, um, if you're using it as just bullet points that you can read off that mean nothing for the audience, then your talk isn't ready. So it needs to be an enhancement, not a replacement for your talk. So slides are great. They certainly serve a purpose. There's some amazing talks that involve slides, but just make sure it's, it's an addition to not in replacement of your talk. Yeah. I remember Jeffrey Gettimer years ago, I saw him in Anaheim and he said, you know, slides are free. Use another one. When he was talking about like the font size, I, I always remember it's like never smaller than 48. Yeah. Um, and he may have said this, or I don't know if I just learned it somewhere else, but he said, basically like they should be just kind of an enhancement, right? Kind of nudging you, but it was essentially if somebody, if your enemy, your, your harshest competitor, you know, got your presentation, they shouldn't be able to give it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's a picture. It's a couple of bullets here and there that just remind you of stories just to kind of keep you on track. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like, so again, I'm not negative on, on slides. I, again, I personally don't use them. Um, but in large part, cause I don't want to be dependent on them. Like I want the talk to be solid on its own and I don't want to use it as a crutch to, you know, kind of a bail out in case I, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting what I'm talking about or whatever. So over the years then, I mean, would you say your talk is it's totally memorized or is it you just know on the timing, like when to sprinkle in the stories and, and you, you just, you know, the bullet points and can just stick to that timeline. So I think about it like this. Um, I, there's certain pieces that are, um, 
like the general flow of a talk. So, if, you know, one of my core keynotes, if you were to ask me to give that right now, I probably could um, off the top of my head. And there's going to be parts that like, this is the way I, sh I tell the story, or this is the phrase that I use, or this is the point that I use. And it's always like this. And here's the exact wording that I use. The other parts of it, I would say, um, is more less about all the, um, the exact wording and more about the essence of that. And so a way to think about this is, um, when you're working on a, your, your talk, I recommend that you actually manuscript the talk out and specifically stories, because I think you can actually tell them better, but you don't have to memorize it like a script, you know? So if, if someone, you know, if, if you and I are at a, a game and someone's singing the national anthem and they butcher the lyrics, like we all know that they butcher the lyrics because we all know what the lyrics are supposed to be. Uh, but uh, if someone's, if, if someone, if you're giving a talk right now, or if you're telling a story and you do the points out of order, or you skip something, or you forget something, or you add something in, I, as an audience member, I don't know the difference. Like, I don't have any, I don't have any script that I'm going along with. Like, oh, wait, wait, skip this point. Or do you want, you, can you go back to this point? I don't have any of that. I don't know where you're going with the talk. Right. So, um, so it doesn't have to be this verbatim, ver, verbatim thing. Why I recommend, recommend uh, actually writing it out is if I said, all right, Wes, um, you've been married for a long time. Tell me about whenever you proposed to your wife. Like you could probably tell me that story off the top of your head. But if you sat down for 30 minutes and really thought about it and thought about the details and thought about the moment and thought about your reactions and thought about what you said or what she said, you know, who you called the first, you know, as soon as, you, as, soon as she said yes, if you thought all that through, you could probably tell the story better. Uh, and so that's where I recommend like actually writing it out. And so you're not like delivering it word for word in the same way that if I were to ask you, Hey, tell me about when you proposed to your wife and you're like, man, I'd love to, but I don't have my slides or I don't have my notes <laughs> or I don't have my manuscript with me. No, no, you can tell that, but you could tell it better if you really thought it through and, and mapped out what you were going to say. So, um, so that's kind of the way, like, um, you know, if, again, let's go back to the analogy of like comedians. You, if you see a comedian tell a story and then a year later you see him tell the, like you can, you can, Google this for some comedians, you can watch them do it, something on uh, Netflix and then you can watch them do, you know, the same story on YouTube um, or, you know, somewhere else. Uh, and there may be parts of it that are like word for word verbatim, the way they delivered a key line. And there are parts of it's like, yeah, it's the same story. And, you know, a few little pieces maybe switched around or moved or, you know, they use a different line or different wording. So that's the way I, I tend to, I tend to think about uh, a talk. Are you uh, ever afraid of just going blank? Yeah, I think, um, so one thing I'd recommend is to remember that the audience takes their cues from you, that you are in control of the room. And so when, uh, when something like that happens, if something, uh, if you draw a blank and it's not a big deal to you, it's not a big deal to the audience. So we've probably both seen speakers and you can tell like they're up front, they're nervous, they're uncomfortable, they're fidgety, they're sweating. <laughs> and like, as an audience member, you're just like, oh man, this just makes me feel uncomfortable. It's just painful to watch. Versus if someone's up there, they're having a good time, they're laughing, they're enjoying themselves. It, it tends to cause the audience to feel the same. It removes some of the pressure. So uh, I remember like literally a couple of weeks ago, I was doing some Q&A uh, at the end of a talk with an audience and a uh, lady asked a question. I'm, I'm like, I have a good point I'm making. And I just draw a blank. And I'm just literally like, wait, what were we talking about? What was the question? And where was I going with that? And I'm like, I just, I couldn't even get back on, like, I, I don't remember where I was going. So I was like, I'm sorry, we just got to go to the next question. And it was like one of those, like, eh, it was a funny moment and it's not a big deal to me. So it's not a big deal to her. So like, if that happens, one thing you have to remember is that you are a human speaking to a collection of other humans. So be human. Like nobody wants to watch a speaker that's just this robot and da, 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 and I'm going to regurgitate my script and then I'm going to take five steps to this side of the stage. I'm going to move my arms in this certain way. And like nobody wants to see that. Like again, you're a human talking to a collection of other humans. So if you draw a blank or if you fumble your words, like and you just keep moving on and you don't care, like the audience doesn't care either. So don't make it a big deal. Yeah, it's... That's tough though, man. I, in Jacksonville, the guy before me, and he was like a repeat, like a well-known dude, but he was hooked on his slides. Yeah. And it was a train wreck, man. And I actually left the room. I'm like, I can't, yeah. I'm not, I'm not watching that before I go talk. Right. Yeah. So I left and they're like, okay, they're ready for you. And, and, and then they messing up my slides. Yeah. So yeah. they, they, they had an issue Right. But this, again, this was a golf theme. We were at a golf resort and, and I'd asked one of the organizers to, uh, I used his golf clubs as a prop. Yeah. Right. So I, I carried the, I, I was carrying the clubs on stage, like as they introduced me, you know, like, what is this guy doing? And so I, I pull the club out and, and they're, they're dinkering with the slides. And I'm like, I just start talking. 
Yeah. You know, and at the end, guys were like, man, you were like so calm, whatever. Like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Thing, right. I mean, yeah. you, you can't just shit the bed, man. It's like, <laughs> but it's also, I, I think the reason we don't shit the bed is because we have shit the bed. Yeah. Right. I mean, you got to fail sometimes and realize it's not permanent. Well, and at the same time, I'd say this also comes back to like your, you know, your level of preparation. So if it's just kind of like, eh, I'm just going to kind of get up there and give a couple thoughts and I'm going to give seven points, but I haven't even thought about what those seven points are going to be until I'm walking up on stage. Like, yeah. I hope you fail. Like, I hope you struggle and I hope it's a train wreck, <laughs> you know, uh, because the audience doesn't deserve that. Like they deserve your best. And so, um, so, so for a speaker, like you should spend the time to like, make sure like when you get up, you feel like, no, no, I've put in the work. Like I, the, the audience is going to get my best here. I busted my butt. Um, because the other thing too, is people are worried about like, you know, I, what do I do if I get nervous? What do I do if I, if I panic, the more that you've prepared, the more that you've practiced, the more confident, the more comfortable you're going to be. You're still going to have the nerves. You're still going to have the butterflies. You're still going to have kind of the anxiety and that's fine. Like there a certain level that's good and normal because it tells you like it tells you that it matters versus if you're like i feel nothing right now like yeah you, you might be dead inside that could be a bigger red flag but when you feel some of that nerves that's fine but when you know like even though i'm nervous like i know i've prepared i know i've rehearsed i know i've practiced i know my material inside and out then you get up on stage and you deliver versus like eh, i'm just going to kind of go through the motions and see what happens like don't don't do that so somewhere in the promotion of this episode is going to be why Grant hopes you fail. So, you know. Uh. <laughs> hey, if the person before you speaking bombs, it makes you look better when you have your act oh, together yeah. and you get up on stage next. <laughs> they couldn't even tell. You know, I was from Louisiana and, you know, and English was an elective. I mean, they, they couldn't even tell, man. It was like, <laughs> I seemed really smart. This guy's brilliant. Very nice. All right, man. Well, this has been awesome. Uh, your book is coming out. We're going to release this just in time. Um, February 2020. Uh, where should we send people? Should we send them to your website, your book website? Where do you want them to go visit you? Yeah, yeah. The book is called The Successful Speaker, Five Steps for Booking Gigs, Getting Paid, and Building Your Platform. So we dig into that speaker success framework, uh, the five-step roadmap. We dig into that a lot more. So uh, yeah, the, if you want to pre-order the book, uh, depending on when you're listening to this, you can go to thespeakerlab.com slash book, thespeakerlab.com slash book. In fact, if you pre-order the book, um, we'll give you the audio book for free as well. Nice. Um, so uh, lots of free bonuses there to uh, definitely check out. The book comes out February 18th. So you've got a couple days past that to pre-order. And then um, after that, all those bonuses go away. So uh, definitely order it as soon as possible. And again, like we talked about at the beginning, whether you're someone that wants to speak, you know, 50 times a year or five times a year, uh, uh, this book was designed to be more of a, a long-term handbook and guide. It may be the type of thing like, all right, I'm going to read a couple things and I'm going to go implement for the next month or two. And then I'm going to come back and I, I just booked a gig. I need to find that chapter on contracts or I'm talking with a potential client. I need to find the chapter on, you know, fees and negotiating. So I'm going to go pull that out and, and resource and, and, and reference it. So, uh, let us sit on the shelf there and be a resource and guide for you long term. Uh, if, if you do any type of speaking at any level, then uh, the successful speaker is the book that you need. Nice. Very cool. Grant Ballerwin, all the way from Nashville, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Wes. Appreciate it, brother. If you're creating a new talk every time, you're in trouble. I love it. And look for others in your niche. Um, you know, I told that story with uh, Oakwood Homes. Competition is not a bad thing. Just be better to, than them. All right. Um, so get out there and start flapping your gums. I'm telling you, when you are on stage, you're seen as the expert. When you're seen as the expert, your people are attracted to you. When they're attracted to you and they see you as an expert, you get a lot less objections. You get a lot less price resistance and you'll get more gigs. You'll get more consulting gigs, sell more books. You'll just, you'll get more of what you want, but you got to put yourself out there. Okay. So Starts with listening to this book or this podcast with getting his book. And, you know, if you need some one-on-one -on -one help, hit me up. Uh, I don't do too much one-on-one, -on -one, but um, I do have spots open from time to time. I do some small groups. Uh, I do a lot of small groups, five, ten people, uh, short term, right? I'm focused on results. Um, you know, I'm helping a medical practice right now. They're launching in multiple cities and working with their team. They weren't getting the help that they needed, and I wish I had record on I usually record our training sessions, but this was a last-minute deal, and um, they're going live in the morning with um, 
the things we've created. And she said she was, it's like getting an MBA working with me. And I'm about to get her to say that on a recording. <laughs> I'm sure she will. I sure hope. But um, on our first call last week, we only worked together for a week and a half. And I was stepping in after uh, they, they tried a remote service and it just didn't, it wasn't sufficient because they just had too much to do and they're too new to the software. And it, um, it was just the wrong service. So I stepped in and, you know, she said in an hour she got done what it took a month to do. So when you invest money in an expert, what you're getting is fast results. Okay, don't worry about the hourly rate. Worry about focus on the ROI to you. Just like a heart surgeon, right? Would you feel better if that heart surgeon, you know, kept you open for 24 hours rather than, I don't know, 24 minutes? Right? Pay for the results. Dig deep. I always say it's better to pay more than you want it than less than you should. Get the help you need to have fast results. Uh, I'm working on a few things. So one is that, um, you know, various small group coaching. I'm working on a on a proposal class where you stop chasing and you stop being uh, pushed around when giving proposals. I see it. I've seen it way too often. You know, I've I've been in corporate America since 97. I was in sales for a long time in corporate America, high tech. Uh, and I've obviously been on my own since 06. And people hit me up with proposals. You know, they want me to give a proposal. And you don't make money giving proposals. I've got a blog post, you know, it says there's only three things that can happen when you give a proposal and two of them are bad. So I've mastered how to navigate those waters. I give almost no proposals. Uh, I still close big deals. Uh, when I do give a proposal, I win 90% plus of them and I make more money. I sell them at higher prices, right? So the key isn't to lower your price. The key is what I'll cover in the program. So if you're interested in that, I don't even have a web page up for it. You know, hit me up on, um, on my website, message me wherever is easy for you, right? Twitter, Facebook, whatever, hit me up and, um, be happy to give you some details and see if there's an opening uh, when you hear this. You know, I uh, just put it out on Facebook today, actually. Uh, once I do a few of those live, uh, some short, intensive uh, programs, then I'll, I'll take the best of and bottle that up as a course, you know, you can do on your own. But um, I know you get better results when you are doing it with someone. Uh, we've all bought things and, and just didn't finish it, and that's not my goal. The goal is not to just make money off you. My goal is to help you make money off of me, and then I get paid well to help you get paid even better. Okay, so like I said, just hit me up if that's of interest to you. Uh, if you need a speaker, hey, give me a shout, hirethebestspeaker.com. I am your guy. And um, unlike, well, kind of what we talked about, um, I don't um, I don't give the exact same talk, but the the core never changes. The principles never change. Uh, but I will customize it to, you know, throw in some relevant examples. And, you know, so I'm not giving golfing examples to the, you know, window washing conference. Uh, but it's crazy how things apply. You know, I spoke in Slovenia last year, and um, that was, golly, it's actually a year and a half ago. Time flies. So speaking to folks, you know, where English isn't their first language, they're primary marketing people. But at our core, everything we do is sales. Uh, you know, I spoke, one of my first paid speaking gigs was a conference in Las Vegas. Um, and it was the ICCFA, so Cemetery and Cremation um, Association. But hey, same issues of sales and marketing. So, you know, if, um, if you need somebody to come in, stay sober, customize it, tailor it, promote it ahead of time, get there early, stay late, bring me in. Okay, hire the best speaker dot com. Uh, be sure to subscribe so you get these episodes right away. I've got a few copies left of my book, The Sales Whisperer Way. Get you a signed copy at 79stories.info. Be happy to send you that. 
And other than that, thanks for listening. Now go sell something.